Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep by EAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. I welcome you back to today's newspaper analysis from the Hindu newspaper. As you know, every single day sharp at 10 a.m. We bring this live analysis session to you where we discuss some of the most important news stories from the mains and the prelims point of view. I'm glad that all of you have made it a habit of joining in right on time at 10 a.m. The biggest advantage that you would get by joining these sessions live is that you can also ask questions, whatever doubts you would have. Also, you can interact in the chat as well and resolve each other's doubts. Now, these are the topics that we have here lined up for you. From the mains examination point of view, we have taken up three topics from the Hindu newspaper today. We'll be discussing the concept of digital lending. In simple terms, the concept of digital lending is actually related to the idea whether certain material can be photocopied, can be sold or does it go against the right of the publisher. Then we'll be discussing about the UN water conference that was recently held. And the third topic will be the king of Bhutan who is in India. He is in talks with the Indian Prime Minister. So what can we expect from these bilateral talks between India and Bhutan? Then from the prelims point of view, again, a lot of news stories. Number one, the biggest news story of yesterday was that Finland has finally officially joined NATO. As you know, ever since the Ukraine-Russia war began, Finland, Sweden, multiple other countries which are very close to Russia had been asking or requesting to join NATO. Finally, Finland's application has been accepted. Then we'll be discussing about the Lokpal. There was a statement made in the parliament from the side of the government that Lokpal has closed 68% of complaints without any action as such. Then Germany may offer some submarines to India and in the end, we'll be discussing about the vacancies for judges that are piling up in the courts across the country. So these are the important topics that we have lined up here for you. Let's not delay any further. Let's begin with the very first article of our importance. The first article that we have here is on the topic of digital lending. Now, what exactly is the idea? Basically, there is a non-for-profit organization called Internet Archive. Please understand this. There is an organization called Internet Archive. This is a not-for-profit organization. What they want to do is they have been compiling a set of millions of books, millions of other kind of files and they are lending it to people just like in a usual library. So they are making a list, a compilation of millions of digital versions of different books, journals, important papers, etc. that have been created and they act as a library. If someone wants to issue or get the book issued for some time, they will issue the soft copy of the book to the person and then the person will have to return it back. In simple terms, this is the idea of Internet Archive. Now, Internet Archive in simple terms can also be considered as a digital library. I am sure all of you in your school, college would have used a library. If not for taking or borrowing books, then maybe just to spend some time. Now, when you go in a library, it has hundreds and thousands of books. You can borrow any book for some time period for one week, two weeks or three weeks and then you have to give it back. As simple as that. Exactly the same happens here, Internet Archive. Does that, it happens in an online form. So you can borrow online or soft copy versions of these books, etc. And you have to give them back. That is a simple idea. Now, it all seems good, right? that anyone who wants to take knowledge can borrow these kind of books, knowledge can spread all across the world. Now, who would have a problem with that? If everything is fine, then who exactly would have a problem with that? The problem here is, are with the publishers. Publishers of the book. So, publisher means the company that would have published the book. Why is that a problem for them? How do the publishers earn money? Let's try and understand that. When any publisher sells the books on the number of books that are sold in the market, that is how the publishers earn money. So publishers obviously will not be happy because if I tell you from tomorrow that all the books that you require, M. Lakshmikant, you require Ramesh Singh book or you require Majid Hussain book, you require any ethics book, all the books that you require, let's assume, are all available on this. You can just go there, borrow it for some time and read. Obviously, you will not buy anything. You will not buy Bipin Chandra, you will not buy NCRTs. So would those companies be happy? Those companies will say, oh, we are 
spending so much money in publishing these books, we are giving money to the author also, and now people are not even buying books, so obviously they will not be happy. So these publishers, book companies, etc., they have approached the courts and they have said, the, especially this has happened in US, so they have approached the US court saying that this should not be allowed, Internet Archive is misusing it. If Internet Archive is spreading these books, etc., to everyone who requires it, then how will we actually earn money? Now, over here, you might also ask a question that if this is not allowed, then how are libraries allowed? Our schools, our colleges had libraries, right? So the question is if digital libraries or these Internet Archives are not allowed, if the publishers have a problem with that, don't they have a problem with the libraries also? The usual libraries that we have, libraries are legal, libraries are everywhere to be found. So what is the difference between physical library and this digital form of a library? The main concept here to understand is, there's a phrase called fair use. There's a phrase called fair use. Now what do we mean by fair use? The idea of fair use is simple, libraries etc are allowed, they can keep these books and they can give these books to people to read and they can return it back as long as there is fair use. Fair use means you are not misusing it, you are not just making copies and spreading it. You are misusing, if you misuse it, then that is a problem, then the publisher will not like it. If you are using it fairly, if you are only giving it to people who require it and then they are giving it back in some time, then there is not a problem. The publishing companies here are saying that in this case of internet archive, in this case of digital library, there is no fair use that is involved. They are giving away the digital copies, soft copies to a lot of people and this actually can bring more harm to the business. Let me give you one more uh, example. When you do an internet recharge and try and uh, just relate to it, when you do an internet recharge, for example, you might have seen that let's say you do a recharge of 1 GB per day data. When you do this 1 GB per day data recharge, have you realized this? That there is a asterisk mark condition that says your speed will reduce after 1 GB. Although it is unlimited data pack, the company says it is unlimited, but they say that FUP is 1 GB. Have you realized this? When you do a recharge, a data recharge, it will show you it's an unlimited data pack, but under this, it will say FUP 1 GB. What does it mean? It means after you use 1 GB, your data speed will decline. Now, what does that mean? FUP means again, fair usage policy. The FUP that you see here is called fair usage policy. So it is the same concept that we are giving you unlimited data, but you have to use it fairly. You can only use up to 1 GB because if you are using more than 1 GB in a day, you are not using it fairly. Maybe you are spreading it to others, maybe from your own internet connection, 10 other people are using internet, only then you are able to spend so much data. So companies say after 1 GB, we will reduce your data speed although it will still remain unlimited. So that is the concept of fair usage. If company believes that you are not using the agreement fairly, then that is a problem. So publishers are saying that Internet Archive is not using it fairly. They are actually allowing other people to make copies and this will be a violation of the copyright. See when an author writes a book, how an author earns money is when the books are sold, the authors get a part of that book or that revenue that is called royalty. Similarly, the publishers earn money when the books are sold. But if everyone just keeps on borrowing one copy of it and making their own copies other than actually giving it back or other than buying the books, that would obviously lead to a lot of harm to the publishers. This is where a policy comes into the picture called Control Digital Lending, CDL. Now, controlled digital lending is same idea of fair usage. That is, even if a book or a magazine has been given or has been loaned out digitally, even then it should be in a controlled manner. For example, let me take, let's 
go back to another example when you go to your library when you go to your let's say school or college you want to issue a book it might happen that the librarian will tell you this book is not available someone else has taken the book already you have noticed that right when you go to your library when you go to your school or college you might only have one or two copies of that book you want to borrow the book but the librarian said no it is already gone exactly the same should happen in a digital library so if you go to internet archive and tell them i want to borrow bipin chandra's book they should not say we have unlimited copies because we have made copies no they should also have one or two copies only if one person has borrowed it other one should not be allowed to borrow it unless that person has returned it back this is called controlled digital lending just like in a physical library not unlimited amount of people can borrow a book only those number of people can borrow a book as the number of copies are available if there are three copies of the books available only three people can take it not more than that similarly over here also in digital format also the idea is that internet archive also should only give those number of books or those number of copies which the agreement is two or three copies and not more than that now this is where there is a debate what is more important the interest of the public is more important or having controlled digital lending is more important because the interest of the public would be that they should be given as many books as people want without any charge over here let me give you an interesting example of what happened in delhi about 10 years back if you are from delhi university or if you have anyone uh, who go who went to delhi university you might know about a case so this is a case that started in 2012 and the decision was given in 2016 by delhi high court now there was a very famous case of rameshwaram photocopy versus oxford publishers let me tell you what the case was in delhi university when students go and study they will have to buy certain books now some books published by oxford university etc oxford publications are very very expensive so what happens is there are a lot of photocopy shops outside delhi university what they do is they will just make a photocopy of the book and they will sell the photocopy that will be much cheaper if the original book for example cost 5000 rupees then the photocopy version will only cost you 500 rupees or 600 rupees only now is this allowed or not because if the photocopy shop is just selling photocopied version of the original book to everyone you would have also seen this you go and take certain books from bookstore they sell you we have a photocopied version so they just photocopy the entire book and sell it to you now the problem here is if the shops just keep on selling photocopied version the publisher will not earn any money the author will not get any royalty so there was a case that went to delhi high court that was a case called rameshwaram photocopy versus oxford publishers this case was oxford publishers said that no our books should not be photocopied because if they are photocopied then we are not getting any revenue on the other hand the photocopy guy said that for us it is more important that education becomes affordable because if half of the people or more than half of the people are not able to buy a book that is 5 6000 rupees 8000 rupees of book then it is better they can spend 500 600 buy a photocopy version at least this case went to the delhi high court in 2016 what did the delhi high court say in 2016 the delhi high court said that the photocopy is, shop is right they have the right to publish this as long as it is required by students and it is a part of the du syllabus they said that if they can justify it as a part of du syllabus the right of the students to get affordable education is more important than the right of the publishers to get their royalty to get their copyright obviously oxford publisher were not happy with the decision but the decision that came in was that the photocopy publisher or photocopy shop was allowed to keep on photocopying it as long as they could justify that what they are doing is is within the syllabus of du only they are publishing that much they cannot just publish or photocopy other things that oxford publications had published they can only publish and sell what is in the du syllabus so 
this issue of photocopy rights or copy rights has always been a very debatable subject. Whether public interest is more important or controlled data lending is more important. It usually depends on case to case basis. As I told you, India does not have a very concrete law about when photocopies etc. will be allowed, how digital libraries will work. The case that we are discussing is the case in US, the reason why this article has been written. In India, there is no specific law about controlled digital lending so far because in India we don't really have a concept of lending books from data libraries. We are too smart, we just try and get free PDF from somewhere. We keep on searching free PDF, free ebooks, and we try and download that rather than actually lending it legally. So in India, we don't have a law for that so far. But the control digital lending initiative around the world has actually been a very contested concept. Now, from the examination point of view, you also have to focus a bit on intellectual property rights, IPR. As you know, intellectual property rights are a very, very important topic and it's a matter of big debate between developed and the developing nations. Developed nations like US, European nations, always keep on saying that countries such as India don't have good copyright laws, they don't have good IPRs, they can't protect our companies, they are not able to protect their company's intellectual property. Now, usually intellectual property rights basically are of two types, copyrights, Copyrights, for example, are on books, song writings, computer programs, etc. The copyrights is usually given for 50 years after the death of the author. So till the time the author is alive and 50 years after the death of the author, the book or any publishing that has been done by the author will be copyrighted. After that, it will be free. After that, it can be used by others. On the other hand, Industrial property like patents, etc., technology, those come in different categories. Patents usually are given for a 20 year period. Remember, we had discussed a few days back about Johnson and Johnson trying to renew their patent for their tuberculosis drug. Remember, we had discussed about that as well. So, patents, etc., are separate, <coughs> they are given for a 20 year period. On the other hand, copyrights are separate. They are usually given for a 50 year period. The government of India also has a national IPR policy. The national IPR policy was introduced in 2016 to give an indication to the developed world that we are serious about copyrights. See, having an IPR policy, having a strong IPR law, etc. is also a component of ease of doing business. If you want to invite big companies from around the world to come and invest in India, do business in India, you have to give them assurance that their copyrights, their intellectual property is safe in India. Only then they will come and do business here. Under that initiative, we have introduced a national IPR policy in 2016. The motive is creative India, innovative India. Basically, the entire idea is that it will be easier to file for patents, copyrights in India and the government of India will make it their priority to ensure that people's copyrights, patents, etc. are safeguarded. Apart from that, the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion under Ministry of Commerce is the department that will look into IPR issues in India. So if any organization has a copyright issue, patent issue, the decision will be taken by Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, DIPP. Also, India is a part of WTO's TRIP agreement, that is, trade related aspects of intellectual property rights. Although we have had multiple debates and discussion on this topic at the WTO level where developed nations are not happy and that is true. I still remember, uh, I still remember there was a time few years back when Microsoft had introduced Windows 7. Now it is Windows 11 so other versions have come up but I still remember there used to be Windows 7 operating system and I still remember when it was introduced Windows 7 Microsoft had announced that it will be impossible to copy this operating system no one will be able to copy it you have to buy the original CD only but after one week in Delhi Delhi has a famous Nehru market CDs were being sold for Windows 7 for rupees 100 
so this is again a problem or you can be proud of it that see we can copy whatever software that we have but on the other hand this is again an indication that maybe the laws are not as straight as they should be that is why even today a lot of people when they have to buy laptop they will not buy a laptop with original windows because original windows will cost about hundred dollars etc so they want to reduce the price they will go to Nehru market they will go to every big city has this electronic market where you will find every pirated software you will find every pirated OS whatever you want all of that and again it is important for a developing country where people can't afford a lot of expensive software but at the end of the day it is not really in the interest of the business because when the companies now start to feel that in India their research etc is not safeguarded then the big companies will stop coming to India because I mean, if they have to come to India they have to at least have assurance that their IP will be safeguarded. So yes, on one hand, it's good that it's made affordable for, but on the other hand, for the larger business interest, it's not that good. Anyway, so this is the first article that we had. Let me take up a few comments before we go ahead. Okay. I have a question. What would be the incentive for the author to write a new book or publisher when there is digital lending or Xerox copy book? No, no, no. So as I told you in India, when the high court allowed Xerox copying, it only allowed it as a part of syllabus. So if the so Supreme Court or sorry, High Court in that case said that number one, the book is not affordable. If the book was anyways affordable, then that would not have been the case. And secondly, the court said only if it is strictly a part of the syllabus, then you can go ahead and you can uh, publish it or you can basically Xerox it. That was the case. Then I have a question. Is it, uh, is it right to suggest must we must have, uh, let me read it again. It's right to suggest that we must have strong laws related to intellectual property as India is also aspiring to become a robust business ecosystem. See, there is no excuse for saying that a country should not have strong laws about IP. Under no circumstances can a country say, no, 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 I don't want to have strong IP laws because IP laws are not just to protect intellectual property of foreign companies coming to India. It's also for Indian companies. If an Indian company has developed something, they obviously would want that to be protected. They don't want others to copy. So IP rights is a necessity for every country. Yes, you have to understand that there may be some circumstances where person's life as it is at stake. Then you'll have to decide whether IP laws have to be upheld or the life of the people have to be uh, changed or have to be compromised. But there is no reason to say that IP laws should not be strict. They should be strict. Okay, I'll take one or two more. Amar is asking internet archive some other purpose. No, Amar internet archive is just like a digital library only where you can borrow books, journals and many other things, software, etc. Uh, okay. Radhika is saying, so US based data library will be punished? No, the US court has not asked, uh, has not given any punishment to them. US court has taken their side only. Okay. Then I have, uh, okay, I'll take one last question, then we go ahead. By accessing the photocopy of someone's book, which is not more famous, it also helps them to be famous and give them platform. It, <laughs> see, there is a famous line which says imitation is the best form of flattery. You can argue that. But then at the end of the day, if someone is writing a book, the ultimate aim is to earn royalty out of it. And you tell me, no, I'm not giving you royalty. I'm just making you famous. What will I do with all that fame? If I am so famous that people just keep on buying my photocopy only, then what will I do with all that fame? So yes, in the beginning you might say, yes, you are giving you fame, we are making you famous, etc. That is the same thing as saying that many, and this is true, many film producers actually ask the singers to come sing in their movies and they say, we will not give you money, why? Because we are giving you fame. People will know your name and then they will give you movies tomorrow. You will get shows tomorrow. So again, that is not how it works. You cannot just say that I'm making you famous. You will become famous. So you don't take any money from that. 
it's not that easy. Anyway, okay, let's come back. The next article that you want to discuss is about a recent conference held especially on the war, on the issue of water. So UN water conference was held about 10 days back. The interesting part is this conference was held after a period of 46 years. It is after 46 years that this conference was held where nations around the world focused on one single most important issue that we are facing as a humanity that is the use of water. How can we preserve groundwater? How can we make sure that water that is required by our future generations is safeguarded? How can we make sure that water is not misused whenever we want to use water, let's say for agricultural purposes or even for our day to day activities? We have to make sure that all this water is conserved. Now, this is what the article is about. So the article tells you what happened it, at this conference. What were the different initiatives that were taken? What is it that the countries decided? So as I said, this conference was held after 46 years in New York. It was based on a report that came up titled Water for Sustainable Development 2018 to 2028. Now the nations around the world are struggling with how to make sure that the groundwater depletion does not happen at a very fast pace. It's not just in India, but a lot of other agricultural nations specifically are facing this problem that the groundwater level is declining and because of the declining groundwater level we are facing a lot of issues such as droughts etc such as the agricultural patterns changing that is why the nations around the world have come together and they have decided to work on it it is also in line with sustainable development goal number six which is specially based on water only the last time such a conference was held was in 1977. That was the last UN water conference where the nations around the world decided that we have to ensure there is equal access of drinking water, portable water to nations all around the world. Now, water is something which we take for granted. And you would also know, you wake up in the morning, you open the tap, the water comes in, you don't even think twice. But the day that you open the tap and the water doesn't come, this is where your entire day will get ruined because the beginning of the day is on such a note because you need water for every single thing for cleaning purposes for drinking purposes for washing purposes for every single thing if something gets stuck to your hand the first reaction that you have is you go open the tap and you wash your hands because this there is no real substitute to water as of now and this is something that we take for granted but in a lot of nations around the world water supply is still not stable. A lot of nations around the world still have a problem about water. The water levels are declining and let's not talk about other nations, let's talk about India itself. There was a Niti Aayog report that came out suggesting that in the next few years, a lot of very important cities in India will run out of water. Did you see what happened in Chennai a few years back when Chennai was facing such a huge drought that the nations around the world, that companies in Chennai announced that please don't come to office, please stay at home, we don't have any water in the office. There was no water in the washroom, there was no water to drink. There are other parts of the country as well where droughts have played a big role. The governments have had to transport water using trains as well. So this issue is not just in India. There are other countries also. Can you tell me by the way, or let me give this a ho as a homework to you. In the comment section, do tell me which was the world's first major city to run out of water. It happened a few years back. Again, please don't tell me here. Tell me after the video ends in the comment section, which was the first city in the world, the first major city in the world that just ran out of water. There was no water available. And that became a big news around the entire world. The hint is it is not in India, not in India, not an Indian uh, city. It's about some other city, but do tell me in the comment section later on. Don't tell me right now. Anyways, so as I said, water issues have been surfacing in many parts of the world and not just India. With increasing population in India and other developing countries, there is more and more water that we require. Also, a lot of our industrial applications require a lot of water. For example, in US, when they try to extract shale gas, they have to use a lot of water. 
in semiconductor industry, in chip manufacturing industry, we need to have billions and billions of liters of water. So water is actually a requirement in every single sphere of life. Now, let me also tell you what happened at the conference, what was decided, what did the countries promise. First, the Indian government said, so every government basically made their own promises. The Indian government said in the conference that we are focusing a lot on our own Jal Jeevan mission to improve water supply in rural areas under which the government will spend 50 billion dollars in the coming years. The other countries also said that we will share data models with each other. World Meteorological Organization for example will offer its tools, satellite data so that every country can understand and can track the level of groundwater in their country. They can take appropriate measures if they believe or if they think that the groundwater is reducing at a very fast pace. Knowledge sharing will also happen with different nations coming together. Capacity building, water for women fund also will come up. Apart from that, training will also be given to people how to preserve water, how to ensure that water actually doesn't become a commodity which is only for the privileged class. All these things are decided in this conference. Apart from that, some other countries also promised, for example, USA announced commitment of $49 billion to invest in climate resistant or resilient water infrastructure. We also had Japan announcing they would contribute 500 billion yen for a solution of water related social issues. Vietnam also pledged that they will ensure that their river basins are much cleaner and clean running water is ensured by 2030. So a lot of different promises were made here. Some promises about collaboration between one and more than one countries and some promises about what the countries will do individually within their own country. Africa for example, African Union Commission said that they want investment up to 30 billion dollar per year to ensure that their water related infrastructure becomes better. European Union aims to support 70 million individuals for drinking water sanitation. Switzerland also submitted five commitments about what they will do about transboundary cooperation of water. So a lot of countries have come up. A lot of countries have promised that we will do this, we will do that, we will help each other with water supply. But the problem here is all the commitments that are made here are non-binding. None of these commitments are binding. Meaning that if any of these countries does not fulfill the promise that they have made, absolutely no action will be taken against them. These are all non-binding commitments that they have made, but if they go, don't go ahead and implement this, nothing really will happen. I also wanted to share this with you. Again, as I said yesterday as well, the more you read newspapers, the more kind of sad and bad news you get many times when you start feeling sad, you start reading articles about diseases, etc. Similarly, when you start reading these articles about how the groundwater is depleting, the situation in India is not very good. If you look at all these states where there is a comparative study done about how the groundwater is decreasing, the red zone as you can see Delhi, Uttarakhand, these places, Gujarat also, Haryana, these are the places where the groundwater is coming out at a very very fast level. Punjab probably at the worst situation right now. Basically those states which have a lot of farming which is water intensive. For example, where rice is grown in large numbers, where sugar cane is grown in large numbers. Those places especially are vulnerable because there the farmers take out a lot of water. We have discussed this already in the past as well. How there is a problem with Punjab that most of the farmers focus on rice cultivation, rice comparatively as compared to other crops takes a lot more water. That is why the groundwater extraction from Punjab, from Haryana, from Western UP is much higher as compared to the other states. And this is why the problem in Punjab, etc. is even more serious. Perfect. So this was the second article that we had about the water related issues. Let me quickly take up a few questions. Okay. Uh, water comes in the tab but there is a serious scarcity of pure potable water how the problem can be addressed as we had discussed earlier potable water is in very short supply 
main source of potable water that we have is the ground water. The ground water, water levels are declining. They can only be addressed or the government can only control the water levels underground is to ensure that farmers, for example, are not taking out a lot more water than what is required. Most of the farmers don't have to pay electricity bills on the equipment that they're using to extract water. That also allows them to extract a lot more water than they require. We need a change in the farming pattern. We need to switch towards those crops that don't require as much water as possible. But that can only happen if the government can assure the farmers that your other crops will also be bought by the government. Because most of the farmers know rice can be bought by the government, rice can be exported easily as well. That is why most of the farmers focus on rice only, that takes a lot of water. So we need a change in the farming pattern as well. Uh, I have given you the solution. See, apart from this, apart from changing the agriculture pattern, there are other ways to ensure that water conservation becomes better. Rainwater harvesting is again a good beginning. Most of the residential complexes in India do not have rainwater harvesting. Only a few of them which are now starting up, building new, only there the government has made it mandatory that you have to ensure that there has to be rainwater harvesting. So rainwater harvesting also has to play a big role. Also when you build concrete all around, the problem is even when the rain falls on the ground because there is concrete, it is not absorbed by the ground. So if you build concrete all around, even when there were jungles, the difference is when there were jungles, the water could seep into the ground, the ground water level will increase. But because all these places have been converted into concrete, the water does not really permeate into the ground. That is also a problem. So all these are issues which are not easy to solve in one single day. These are gradual processes, but yes, there has to be a beginning somewhere. Okay. Then I have a question. Risha was saying, being a river rich country facing water is scarcity is ironic. No, no, no. See, you have to understand, please. When we say there is scarcity of water, please understand, we are not talking about any water. We are talking about fresh water. If you say we have scarcity of water, then that cannot be to three-fourth of the world anyways is water. Three, four, more than three-fourth of the earth surface is just water. So how can we have scarcity of water if that is your logic? But we are not talking about all the water. We are talking about fresh water. That fresh water you are talking about, those sources are very, very rare. Ground water, river, etc. So you can't just take water from anywhere. If that is the logic, then you can say, oh, we have such a big coast and Bay of Bengal, Arabian Sea, how can we have any shortage of water? Let's take whatever water that we have, that we want from there. But that is not how it works. It has to be fresh water. That is the difference between the two. Anyway, let's come back then. The next important issue that has come up in our neighborhood more specifically is that King of Bhutan is in India for talks. Now you might say what has happened with Bhutan, why is it that the king is in India and why is it that there are security issues about this. Now usually India-Bhutan relations are considered as probably the closest relations India has with any neighbor. India supports Bhutan immensely. In fact, year on year, whatever budget that they introduce, a large part of their budget also is supported by India only. The Problem, however, here is one single word and that word is China. What has happened is in the past few years, Bhutan and China have had some interesting conversations. So basically, just like India, Bhutan also has some border issues with China. Let me first show you the map and then we'll come back to this. First, see this photo. Now, if you see this photo, this is Bhutan. And these shaded areas that you have, these are the areas where Bhutan and China have some boundary issue. So this is one area where they have a boundary issue. This is the Doklam region. This is where India went in and there was a tussle between India and China. Then there's an issue over here. And then there's an issue over here. These are the main issues between Bhutan and China. Now, what China has been doing with Bhutan is very similar to India. They just randomly lay claim, this is our territory, this is our territory, this is our territory. Now what has happened is, interestingly, in the past few years, China has been making a lot more claims in Bhutan as compared to earlier. And please now listen to this very carefully. China laid claim to Doklam, okay, India did not like it, but okay, we 
we understand why they made a claim here when China said this is our territory this is Dokla then China made a claim here because both of these are related to are just joined with Tibet but the most interesting part is look at this there is a wildlife sanctuary here Sakteng China said this is their territory but do you know this is not even on border with China do you know that this is Arunachal Pradesh in India this is the border this is where Tibet ends and China says that this is our territory now just imagine you are not even connected to that area randomly you are pointing out that no this is our territory why China says see anyways Arunachal is our area so joining Arunachal this is also our area now what has happened is Bhutan is a very very small country doesn't focus a lot on its military doesn't have a lot of defense budget the recent uh, incident was a few months back there were a lot of satellite images that came in satellite images showed that China has actually built a lot of villages etc here and here not here sorry over here China has built a lot of artificial villages now when these reports came in or when these satellite images came in that China has built a lot of artificial villages here there was a recent interview of the king of Bhutan in this interview Bhutan king was asked that China is building all these villages it is within your territory everyone is worried what do you think and he said that no I don't think that China is building any villages as such so he denied it he said that no our border is where the border always was now India is worried about that because India now thinks is it possible that Bhutan and China are coming into an agreement because see what China does understand this this is a very old trick of China China will occupy two territories in a country and then they will say okay we will give you one and you give us one in return exactly the same happened with India in 1950s China occupied the Aksai chain area that is a part of Ladakh now they occupied Aksai chain and they then started laying claim to Arunachal Pradesh also so when India raised this objection China said okay we will give you Arunachal Pradesh you give us Aksai chain we can have that exchange but India said but both of these are our areas only how can we give how can we give one and take other back China said no 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 this is not your area Aksai chain is also our area Arunachal Pradesh is also our area you take Arunachal then we will give you Aksai chain back do you want to do this exchange obviously no country will want to do that exchange similarly here also India is worried that maybe maybe Bhutan is in talks with China maybe China will tell Bhutan that okay this territory is yours we will not take it but in exchange this territory will be ours the Doklam territory this is what India is worried about that Bhutan and China are in talks China might have offered the same kind of exchange to Bhutan as they had offered to India we don't want Bhutan to accept that okay this will be Bhutan's area China will not say anything but then this will become China's area that is a Doklam region why are we more concerned about this area because this is where India starts so India is more concerned about China getting a territory very very close to our Siliguri corridor we do not want that to happen we do not want Bhutan to fall into that trap in fact just a couple of weeks back China published a very big or very long article so Chinese government has their own newspaper called the Global Times they are so smart they have named the newspaper in such a way that you will not even get to know this is a Chinese newspaper this is but this is actually China government's official newspaper the Global Times which only publishes news about how great China is how bad India is how bad America is how Chinese are the ones who are being exploited by everyone so the Global Times is their own newspaper in Global Times there was an article published two weeks back <clears throat> this article was published by Chinese foreign minister and in the entire article this was about India and Bhutan relations historically how India and according to them how India has always exploited Bhutan how India does not let Bhutan sell its electricity to some other country how India is the only one who wants to invest in Bhutan how China could give much more money to Bhutan it was a very long article 
it was just like an individual. So people preparing for China Civil Service examination when they were they were analyzing their paper every day at 10 a.m. They were reading that article. How India is actually bad for Bhutan. How India is bad for their own neighborhood. That is what China has been doing. So again, that is something that India is aware of. That is why we are not happy with the fact that Bhutan and China are having all these talks. That is why we want that Bhutan King should give us a complete picture of what is it that is in their minds. What do they want to do with China? With Bhutan, India has a very special relation. So much so, Bhutan does not even have embassy in most of the countries. Bhutan only has embassy in 3-4 countries. Apart from that, in other countries, Bhutan operates through India only. So for example, Bhutan doesn't have an embassy in US, Europe, etc. It is through India only that they operate. Citizens of Bhutan are allowed to come to India. Citizens of Bhutan can actually come here and work like Indian citizens. For most of the government jobs, Bhutan citizens are accepted in India. So all of that is again a part of how Bhutan-India relationship has been very close. Bhutan has a lot of hydroelectric potential. India has invested a lot of money in building multiple dams in Bhutan. We even buy electricity from Bhutan. We give them money in return. Bhutan has been demanding that we should give more money for the electricity. We have agreed to that as well. So India has never really given any reason for Bhutan to go away from India. But again, the problem here is that India and China are very different kind of countries. While India can help Bhutan with their budget, India can help Bhutan with different types of job opportunities. China, on the other hand, can apply other tactics. Tactics such as putting pressure on the border, using their own military, using their own force. That is why we are worried that China and Bhutan might end up in this kind of agreement and we do not want that to happen. Now, China-Bhutan border is about 477 km. And as I said, there are multiple territories where there is Chinese claim. The most recent one and the most absurd one, which no one actually believes, was in 2020 when I just showed you, they said that Saktang sanctuary also the part of Chinese territory which does not even share a border with China. This is the same one that I showed you. This is the one where China started claiming in 2020. Apart from that, they have also laid claims in other parts of Bhutan as well. India is worried that we don't want China to grasp Doklam, which is very near to our Siliguri corridor because that will be danger to India. Siliguri corridor, as you know, is a narrow piece of corridor, narrow piece of land with which Indian mainland is connected to the northeast part of India. It is also called the chicken's neck. It's also called the Siliguri corridor. We don't want China to be present anywhere near that specifically. Also, the boundary negotiations between Bhutan and China have been going on for a long time. But usually, whenever there are boundary negotiations between Bhutan and China, Bhutan keeps on telling India exactly what are the negotiations. But in the past two years, Bhutan has talked more to China than India. This is why we have a problem. So in 2021, Bhutan and China signed an agreement also on a three-step process of how to resolve the issue. The details were not made public what was a three-step process. But as I said, India's worry is that now Bhutan, when they talk to China, they are not sharing a lot of details. And that is why India is worried. India doesn't want the Siliguri Corridor to be under pressure of China. We don't want Chinese presence so near to the Siliguri Corridor. These were the three articles from the main's point of view. Please do keep a track of what the Bhutan King talks with the Indian government, what are the outputs, and we'll discuss that in the coming CNAs as well. Let's now go ahead with some of the prelims related news specifically. The first important prelims related news is that finally, Finland has officially joined NATO. As you know, ever since the Ukraine-Russia war had started, Finland, which shares a long boundary with Russia, had been trying to become a member of NATO. But it takes a long time because usually getting membership to NATO would require all the NATO countries one by one to say yes. Only then any new country would be admitted. So Finland has been admitted here. Finally, Russia obviously does not like it. Russia says that no, this will lead to even bigger problems in the neighborhood. Russia says that they will now be even more aggressive with the Ukraine war. Now, if you look at Finland, they share a 1340 kilometer border with Russia. This, first you can see this, this is Russia. 
this is the border that this share with Finland over here. Also, please remember, even before Finland, there were some NATO countries which shared a border with Russia. So it's not that Finland is the first country that has now shared a border with Russia. Norway, you can see here, again shares a border with Russia. There's Estonia, there's Latvia also that shares a border with Russia. There is not, and there's Lithuania also that shares a border with this Russian conclave. It's not that Finland is the first NATO country to have a common border. There are other countries also that do have a common border with Russia. Now, the interesting part is, apart from Finland, Sweden had also applied, but Sweden so far has not got the membership and we'll discuss about that as well. But first, let's focus on Finland. Why is it? that Finland getting NATO membership is a landmark movement. That is because Finland has been very famous for being a neutral country in Europe. In fact, there is a very famous term used called Finlandization. There's a term called Finlandization. Now, what is this term all about? Basically, Finlandization is a term that came up after a treaty between USSR and Finland. So USSR and Finland had a treaty in 1948. It was a treaty of neutrality. It was called agreement of friendship, cooperation, mutual assistance. First article of that treaty, article number one said, in the eventuality of Finland or Soviet Union becoming the object of an armed attack, the other state will remain as an independent state and will repel the attack. USSR is saying that this entire treaty now has gone. Because under this treaty, Finland had promised USSR they will remain a neutral country. That is why for so many years, Finland did not join NATO. But now that they have joined NATO, USSR or Russia, as you know, does not really like it. They think that now Finland will actually be acting as an agent of the West. Since, USSR, since Russia now shares such a large border with Finland and that too towards the northern side. Again, if you look at the map once again. This is where the war is happening. Look, this is Ukraine. Let me take this pen. This is Ukraine border. So this is where the war is happening. So most of Russian troops are here in Ukraine. Now if they have to focus here also on the northern border, this is a problem with Russia. They don't want to distract their attention. This is where the issue starts. Because they would now have to divide the presence of their military from here to this part where again there are NATO members, again to this part where there will be a NATO country. This is what Russia does not like. Now, there is again something very interesting, apart from Finland also. There is one more country that has been applying to join NATO, but they have not been able to join. That is Sweden. Now, what exactly is the problem with Sweden? Let's try and understand this. Again, if you go back to the map, see, this is Sweden, a neighboring country of Finland. They have also applied that they want to join NATO, but the one country that is stopping Finland or that is stopping Sweden, in fact, from joining NATO is Turkey. Now, Turkey is a very unique country. Turkey is also a member of NATO. Turkey is saying that, no, we will not allow Sweden. Now, why exactly is that the case? Please understand this. Now, Sweden has some very interesting laws. Sweden, for example, has a law and listen to this carefully. Sweden has a law which says if anyone has taken asylum in Sweden, Sweden will not send the person back in their own country if they are to be given a death sentence. Let me repeat that again. If someone seeks an asylum in Sweden, Sweden will not send the person back in their country if the chances are that they go back in their country and they are given a death sentence. They will not allow that because as per the law in Sweden, death sentence should not be allowed. So even if there is a terrorist who may have committed a crime in a country, they run away to Sweden, they ask for asylum. Even then Sweden will not send the person back in their country. Why? Because then they will be given death sentence. Now, this law may be very odd to some people, but for Sweden, it's a very important law of their policy because they are against capital punishment, so they don't want anyone to be hanged. Now, this is where the issue comes into the picture. There is a community in Turkey called Kurds. 
Now Kurds are a minority community in Turkey and not just Turkey but in neighboring countries some of them are in Syria also. So Kurds for a long time in that part of the world have been demanding a new country called Kurdistan. Kurds have been demanding a new country called Kurdistan, a part of Turkey, part of Syria, part of neighboring countries. What has happened is some Kurds have taken asylum in Sweden. Turkey is saying we will only say yes to the NATO membership of Sweden if they send these Kurds back to Turkey. That is the only condition. If they don't send these Kurds back to Turkey, we will not give them the permission. We will not allow Sweden to join NATO. Now, this is where the problem starts. Would Sweden go against their own law just because they want NATO membership? Would Sweden allow or ask the Kurds to go back just because they have, they know the importance of NATO membership right now? Or would Turkey now have a compromise somewhere? Because right now, Turkey is adamant that we will not allow Sweden to be a part of it. Turkey's logic is simple. Turkey says, according to NATO principle, an attack against one of us is an attack against every one of us, right? So Turkey says, Kurds are attacking my country. Kurds are a social secu are a security threat to my country. Then they should be a security threat to everyone. So how can I accept Sweden to be a part of NATO if they are not even allowing the Kurds to come back? That is why Sweden so far has not been a part of NATO. That is because of Turkey's objection. We have to see if Turkey actually comes ahead and says and agrees to Sweden becoming a part or not. The next article that we have is about Lokpal. Lokpal, as you know, came into being after a lot of protest in the, under the India Against Corruption movement led by Anna Zare, Arvind Kejriwal and all these people. Lokpal is a statutory body. It's a primary anti-corruption body in the government of India. When the Lokpal was formed, if you remember, there was so much protest in the country. People thought that once Lokpal comes into picture, everyone will be free of corruption. India will be a, the most, corrupt, most corruption less country in the entire world. We will not have any issue. But the reality is even after so many years of Lokpal coming into picture, there has not even been one single important case which Lokpal has solved. In fact, the government has said in the parliament, 68% of complaints are without any action even right now. The government has said that 90% complaints were not in the correct format, so they were rejected anyways. And not even a single person has been prosecuted till now for any corruption charges by the Lokpal. Now this is so, so weird because it has been so many years since the Lokpal came into picture. There were so many talks that once Lokpal comes into being, everyone will be scared of corruption. Lokpal can even take action against minister. Lokpal can even take action against members of parliament as well. But in reality, the Lokpal has not even given punishment or they were not even prosecuted one single person. There are a lot of reasons before, behind that. Why is it that the Lokpal has not been able to work properly? As you know, the first chairman of Lokpal was P.C. Ghosh. Pinaki Chandra Ghosh appointed in 2019. He left the office in May 2022. Since then, there is no permanent Lokpal chairman. There is an acting chairman of Lokpal. As you know, the problem with the Lokpal is that they do not have their own investigative agencies as such. But again, the Lokpal was supposed to be an independent corruption fighting agency. It was supposed to be an agency where you can go file a complaint and they would take up these complaints against high ranking official as well. If you look at the website of the Lokpal, which tells you against whom you can file a complaint to the Lokpal, it even includes a prime minister. In certain cases, even against a prime minister, you can file a complaint to the Lokpal. In terms of international relations, internal external security, atomic energy, space, apart from all these, you can file a complaint against the prime minister as well with the Lokpal. You can file a complaint against a union minister, member of parliament, group A, B, C or D officers. So the Lokpal has a lot of powers in the sense that even against high ranking officials, there are complaints that can be filed.
But again, the problem is so far, none of these have resulted into any prosecution. The excuse that the government has given is over 90% of the complaints filed are not in the correct order and that is why they have been rejected. You must know how Lokpal works. Lokpal has a chairperson and maximum of 8 members. I am sure you have read this in Indian polity. The chairperson should be either retired Chief Justice of India or a retired Supreme Court Judge or 25 years of experience in anti-corruption policy, public administration, insurance, banking, law management, etc. Either retired Chief Justice of India or retired Supreme Court Judge or having 25 years of experience in any of these fields that are given. Then there have to be 8 members, 4 have to be from Judiciary and 4 members can be from non-Judiciary as well. The members from Judiciary have to be either Supreme Court Judges or High Court Chief Justices and those who are non-judicial members from outside the judiciary they again have to be from 25 years of experience in these fields. Right now there are total of 6 people only in Lokpal. If you go to the website of Lokpal you will see most of the seats, a lot of these seats are vacant. We don't even have a full time chairperson of Lokpal right now. We have an acting chairperson. Out of the 8, only 6 members have been appointed. These seats have been vacant for a long, long time. The term of office is 5 years. They work till 70 years of age. They are appointed on the recommendation of a selection committee. That committee comprises of the Prime Minister. There is a Lok Sabha Speaker. Leader of Operation, the Lok Sabha. Chief Justice of India and one eminent jurist. They are the ones who recommend the name to the President of India. And then the President of India will appoint the Lokpal. This is how the Lokpal works. Those who are asking Lokpal and Lokayukth, Lokayukth works at the state level, Lokpal works at the central level. So India would have one Lokpal and every state individually would have a Lokayukth. So Lokayukth is a state government body. The next important article that we have is Germany may offer to sell some submarines to India, normal diesel run submarines not the nuclear version. They have offered that if you want, we can sell you certain submarines. A total of six submarines will be sold. Diesel electric submarines to the government of India. This is a part of project 75-1 or 75-I if you want to call it. Indian Navy right now is short of certain submarines, although we do have some submarines of our own, but to ensure that we protect our entire coastline, Indian government is looking to acquire, looking to have more submarines. That is why we are trying to see from where we can get these submarines. Now, please understand, submarines is one of the most expensive and most time-taking defense equipment in the entire world. It takes many, many years to build even one single submarine. For example, when you look at the AUKUS, the order given by Australia, it will take many years before that order is fulfilled by US or UK. So even here, submarines usually take a long lot of time. Indian government, that is why, has been running a project called P-75-1. Under this, the plan is to acquire more submarines, build them in India as well, and acquire them from outside as well. Under this project, we have partnered with manufacturers in South Korea, France, Spain, Russia, and Germany to get submarines. Right now, Navy has 16 submarines in service. Seven are from Russia. Four are from Germany, five are from France. Many of them are also very old. Many of them would have to be replaced as well. Now I wanted to share with you some of the details of this project 75. Again, this is a project under which the aim is that Indian Navy should acquire their own indigenous submarine construction plan. The idea is under this plan, India would have 24 submarines indigenously designed means made in India designed in India basically this project had two parts in the first phase from 2000 to 2015 that was the first phase then the second phase started in the second phase six submarines have been taken up for designing but this project as with most of the other projects is actually going on at a very slow pace the problem with most of these defense construction projects is we are dependent on the other countries for some internal parts. It gets delayed. 
when there are change in governments not just india but in other countries from where we have to buy parts it all keeps on delaying also whenever any kind of defense project gets delayed the cost also increases considerably there are delivery delays there are costs that are involved here that is why submarines are usually considered as the most difficult equipment to acquire because to acquire submarines you have to ensure that you keep everything on track the expenses are on track the technology also becomes obsolete very very soon so government of india might take up some submarines from germany the decision to actually acquire any defense equipment depends upon defense acquisition council dac is the highest decision making body when it comes to acquiring any defense equipment in india please do remember this this council is headed by the minister of defense this was formed after 1999 kargil war once the kargil war took place after that we realized that we need to have a proper approach streamlined approach of what kind of weapons do we have to buy from where do we have to buy the weapons and only for that we made a specific body called the dac defense acquisition council they have to take the final decision whether we want to buy these submarines from germany or not the last article for today is based on a recent report that has come out called the india justice report the india justice report gives us the same story that we have already known for many years it's an unfortunate fact but we all know the problems in the indian judicial system the lack of judges lack of infrastructure the long pending cases all that is something that all of us are very well familiar with this has been highlighted in the india justice report as well india justice report says that in high courts across the country the total strength has to be 1108 but right now we are only functioning with 778 judges so over 300 post of judges are vacant not just this subordinate courts also the total strength has to be 19288 or total strength has to be 24000 but they are only running with 19000 judges at both the levels we have over 20% vacancy not just at the high court level but even at the subordinate court level the report also talks about pending cases in the high court the average case in any high court takes 11.34 years just imagine in uttar pradesh it takes 11 and a half years for even one case to be decided in west bengal it takes 9.9 years for one case to be decided the high court that takes the shortest time for deciding a case is tripura tripura has a one year period even one year is a long time but tripura has a shortest period that is only one year to decide the case then the case load is also increasing infrastructure is coming down we have discussed how earlier a few months back the chief justice of india himself made a statement that in most of the local courts across the country we don't even have separate washroom for women so how can you expect women judges how can you expect women lawyers to come and attend these kind of courts infrastructure issue still remains there is also vacancy at a lower level not just the judges even at the administrative level there is a lot of vacancy the one good part about the entire report is increasing number of women judges that is the only positive part there are more women judges at district level than at the high court level also the share of women judges has increased in certain states at least and if not in all states yes there is still very little presence of women judges at the high court at the supreme court level but at least at the lower court level the situation is increasing slightly also this report is published by whom this is not a government report please remember this report is published by the tata trust in collaboration with certain ngos called center for social justice common cause daksh vidhi center for legal policy etc they are the ones who deliver the report it is not a government report but even then it's a reputed report so in the examination in the mains exam especially if you want you can quote this report as well this brings us to the end of today's session of the hindu news analysis there are a couple of practice questions for all of you if you want please do try and write the answers to these questions you can use our student answer link portal check each other's answers also give feedback the link to use the answer writing portal is given the description of the video 
Also, after this session ends, go over to our Telegram channel to attend the quiz. Reminding you of the homework, you have to tell me in the comment section, first major city of the world run out of water. I'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. once again with the next session of the Hindu News Analysis. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.